Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you this morning and to worship with you today. Uh, there is Amen Bingo cards in the back for kids, uh, as is our tradition on Communion Sunday. So please make sure you grab one of those cards and receive your prize after the service. Um, as we gather here today, and one of the things that was on my mind as soon as I woke up this morning was uh, April showers bring May flowers. It was a bit, a bit dreary this morning when I woke up, and uh, driving in, it was gorgeous, and the sun was shining. And it just, uh, what, was also, what also struck me in my own personal readings this week, week was the timelessness of God's word, and how it is unchanging and always true and it is with us forever. But yet we have seasons that come and go, and uh, the timelessness of God's word is, all, is a comfort to us, and that truth is a comfort to us. But also, the seasons come and go. They bring flowers, and they bring cold, and then it repeats over and over again. And we can always anticipate that <clears throat> and expect that, and we know it is coming, and that is a comfort as well. So let's put ourselves humbly before our creator who creates, who is outside of time, but also creates seasons for us to see his goodness. So let us worship him together. Uh, join me today, uh, right now in our uh, approach to God, and we'll do this in unison. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for our time to worship together today. We are grateful for your timelessness and how you never change and you're always true. We are grateful for your seasons. We are grateful for each person here today to be able to worship you. Lord, help us to humble our hearts before you, to rest in your truth, and to proclaim it with boldness. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Stay standing with me as we confess our faith. And another one of our traditions here, as we do this in our children's worship service, uh, as tradition on Communion Sunday, we always say the, Lord, uh, the Apostles' Creed together. So, 
Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. come to worship the Lord this morning. It's not just you and him. It's us together as one, as the body of Christ, worshiping together. So let's take a moment now just to acknowledge that by turning and greeting those who are with us this morning.
Well, I'd like to welcome everyone again, and the attendance registers are going to be coming forward. Um, please uh, sign in if uh, you will. You can give us your information in the register. I would also like to direct you to the back of the bulletin. Um, there is, we have a website, and there is all the information that uh, we have on RPC and our uh, ministry here that you can feel free to visit. The next part of our service, we are going to receive our tithes and offerings. Um, just uh, as we say in uh, children's worship, um, God gives us everything. He give, and one of the ways that we can worship him is to give a portion of all that he gives to us back to him. So um, let us continue our worship now as we receive our tithes and offerings. Please open your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 8. We've been going through a series in the Gospel according to Luke, looking at different stories along the way that ask and answer the question, who is this man? Who is this Jesus? That's not a simple answer, of course, as we've been going through this for three months, we've found that there's a lot to say, a lot of different aspects of who he is, a lot of different ways he can be described, what he's like, what his heart is. This morning we come to perhaps the most famous of the parables, the parable of the sower, probably better described as the parable of the soils. 
There's a lot of different ways we could go with this in terms of understanding the parable. But in keeping in line with the series that we're working through, we want to especially focus on what does this parable say about Jesus? What does this parable say about the heart of Jesus? So let's read this morning from Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path, and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil, and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when, this, and when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, Hearing the, good, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Let's ask God's blessing on the reading of his word. Oh Lord, our God, as we open up your word now to read it, to speak it, to proclaim it, to listen to it, to hear it, to obey it. Oh Lord, enable us, empower us to do just that. Lord, where your word gives warning, may we heed it. And where it brings comfort and encouragement, may we soak it up. May these words this morning be your words, and may the Holy Spirit indeed use them to bear fruit in our lives. May we be the good soil. Oh Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first paragraph here is one of those paragraphs in Scripture that's sort of a transition piece, and we often kind of blow right through these things. We kind of want to get to, like, the heart of the story or the parable. And so we kind of read through these things, and it's often places that we don't know where they are because we don't know the geography and names that we've never heard before. And so we often just go and go right through them. Let's slow down just a little bit this morning and notice a few things. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. It tells us something about how Jesus sees his mission. That's what he's spending his time doing, going from big cities, little villages, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, who's with him? Your traveling companions, your entourage, says something about you. And the 12 were with him. Well, we know them, the 12 disciples. They're familiar to us. But we tend to think of them as just sort of this one homogenous unit these 12 guys, well, maybe 11 guys and then Judas, well, maybe 10 guys and Judas and Peter the hothead. We kind of think of them as one kind of unit. And we forget how different they were, how diverse they were. Among them were political zealots who were zealous to overthrow Rome. Among them was a tax collector, an employee of Rome, extorting his own people. Among them were fishermen, 
And Jesus, in his wisdom, brought these guys together to be his entourage, his disciples. Let's not forget what a strange assortment of men that was. The twelve were with him, and also some women. Not just any women, women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Maybe that doesn't sound strange to our 21st century ears, but in the ancient world, that would sound very strange. You don't advertise your blessed leader's entourage by saying he's being followed by a bunch of women. Joel Green said this was extraordinary in the ancient world to mention women among a leader's closest followers. This went against all societal norms. Not just any women, women who had demons, women who were sick. These were people who were not high on the totem pole. Often outcast, often overlooked, and yet it says these were some of his closest followers. And then they named three by name. First one, Mary called Magdalene. We don't know much about Mary. Much has been suggested, but we really don't know that much about her. It says here that she was healed from seven demons. We also know that this Mary watched the crucifixion. In Mark 15, at the foot of the cross, the centurion says, truly this was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. Mary was there. Mary Magdalene was there. And she saw where Jesus' body was laid, as it says in Mark 15, 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Next verse, chapter 16. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Mary Magdalene was a close follower. She followed him all the way to the cross. Many of the disciples fled. They got out of there. They didn't want to be associated with this. But Mary was there. And saw the whole thing. She was there at the cross. She was there at the tomb. And she went back to anoint his body at the tomb. Mary was there. Joanna is the next person mentioned. She was Herod's official's wife. We don't know exactly what her husband did, but he was close to Herod. She came from the politically and financially elite, the aristocracy. Close ties with Herod. But Joanna was a follower. In fact, she went to the tomb as well. In Luke 24, we read of the women who go to the tomb, and who do they find? Two men blazing white, that Jesus isn't here. And in 24, verse 8, and they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Mary Magdalene and Joanna were there. They went to anoint the body to discover that there is no body, that it had been resurrected. They're the ones that went back to the disciples and said, he's risen. And the last woman named here is Susanna. And you remember the story of Susanna, don't you? Raise your hand if you remember the story of Susanna. No one. Okay, so either you're all terrible Bible students or you're honest because this is the only place in Scripture where she's mentioned. Trick question. This is the only mention of Susanna in the Bible. The one time her name comes up, and it says that she's a follower of Jesus. And that's all we know about her. Wouldn't it be great if the only thing that was known about you so you were a follower of Jesus. You know that guy over there? I don't know anything about him, but I know he's a follower of Jesus. If that's the only thing that you take with you, you're doing well. Well done. Well done, Susanna. A follower of Jesus. 
and there were many others as well who provided for them out of their own means. In other words, they supported them financially and otherwise so that Jesus could minister. These people came from all economic classes, like Joanna's husband, a tax collector who was wealthy, simple fishermen. They all came. And they were followers of Jesus, which says something about Jesus himself. Now, after this parable, if we skip ahead in Luke 8 to verse 19, it says his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. And Jesus says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. What Jesus is doing is he's differentiating between earthly biological families and heavenly spiritual families. He's not trying to downgrade one. He's trying to lift them both up, but there's a difference between them. And he says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. He's speaking of the heavenly, spiritual, eternal family. Not the earthly families that are temporary, and only a shadow of the reality of God's family. It says, those that listen and do it, those are my family. And this reflects back on the beginning of the chapter, and those who are following him, the 12 and the women. It comes back around, and what he's saying is, those 12 and those women, they're my family. These are not just some hangers on, my followers that I'm, a, my fan club that I'm allowing to sort of tag along with me. No, they're my family. They hear the word of God, they do it. These are my brothers, and my sisters. This is the family of God. See, everyone finds equal status when they're followers of Jesus. In Galatians 3, we read that when you put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And we've been reading throughout Luke. What we've learned is that the gospel is for everyone, even sinners, as we read about with Levi and the tax collectors. We've read that the gospel is for everyone, even the Gentiles, like the Roman centurion. The gospel is for everyone in the big cities and the small towns. The gospel is for everyone, even the women. Even the ones with demons. In verse 8, he says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is an open invitation to everyone, to any and to all, who will hear the word of God and obey it. Any and all are invited into this to become part of his family. This is not just for the Jews. It's not just for the men. It's not just for the landowners or the aristocracy or the wealthy or the clean or the moral or the respectable or the churchgoers. It's for everyone. For any and for all who have ears to hear, the kingdom of God is open to you. You are invited no matter who you are, genuinely, sincerely invited to come and follow Jesus. To acknowledge him as Lord, to acknowledge him as Savior. To acknowledge that there is no other. There is no other way to be right with God. There is no other way for your sins to be forgiven. Jesus is the equalizer the foot of the cross. There are no class distinctions. Many of you know that Herb Nowak is in rehab right now, but if Herb was here, you know what Herb would be saying. Amen. We need more Herbs. So now we get to the parable. It's a familiar parable to most of us, if not all of us. A sower goes out to sow, the seed goes out, and there's four destinations for the seed. There's the path, there's the rock, there's the thorns, there's the good soil. 
And then the disciples go, we don't get it. Jesus says, I know. So then he explains it. He walks them through it. Here's what it is. Verse 11. The parable is this. The seed is the word of God. We don't have to do any guesswork here about the symbolism. The seed is the word of God. The sower goes out to sow the seed. It's the capital E evangelist, or it's just you talking to your neighbor or your coworker or your children about the word of God. You're sowing seeds. You're sowing seeds. The path are the ones where the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. So they may not believe and be saved. This is just your standard non-believer who listens to the word of God and says, you must be crazy. You don't believe that fairy tale. This is just silly. They just dismiss it out of hand. It does not penetrate at all. Then there's the rock. And what's meant by this is not where you look at a field and you see the rock kind of poking up here and there. What's meant by this is that it looks like it's perfect grass or soil, but it's really thin. And underneath it is just a layer of bedrock. So you can't tell at the outset what's underneath. But what happens when you plant in thin soil? It springs up at first, but then when we hit a dry patch this summer, it all turns brown. There's an immediate joy, but there's no root. It can't absorb the moisture. And so when testing comes, he says, in the time of testing, they fall away. It withers. There is an apparent faith, but it's not a faith that perseveres. And we get to the thorns in verse 14. As for what fell among the thorns... There are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. It stays immature. When you have thorns in the ground, what happens is they suck up all the nutrients out of the soil so that nothing else can grow or grow well. There's not much left. The cares and the riches of pleasures of life often don't leave us with much left. You're exhausted from work, kids' activities, church activities. There's nothing left for family devotions, for your own devotions. Forget about evangelism. It's just not much left in the tank. It's choked out by other things. And so it says it does not mature, literally in the Greek it says it does not bring it to its purpose, to its telos, its end, its goal does not reach its potential. It just stays immature. And then lastly, the good soil. They hear the word of God. They hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. This is the good soil. Someone hears the word of God, they grow in their faith, and they produce fruit in your life, and everyone can see it. It's very obvious to us. Just as an an aside, some of you may have met uh, Shabu, Shabu and his wife Mary have been here a few times. They live out by Green Dragon. He's an ordained teaching elder in the PCA. He's an evangelist. And what he does is he trains people to do evangelism and then does it with them. He's often in places like Philadelphia or Lancaster City doing evangelism with trainees. And this past week he had a whole group of college students from North Carolina up for the week. They were in different places, and on Friday afternoon they were here in Ephrata just doing street evangelism, walking up and down Main Street, engaging in conversations. Now, they came across four different types of people. These are the four different types of people. Now, you don't know which is which. You can't tell just by a quick 15-minute conversation. It takes time to bear these things out. And part of what's probably happening here is that Jesus has come, and everyone assumed that when God's messenger, God's Messiah came, the Jewish nation would surely embrace him. But it hasn't happened. And so the disciples are wondering, what's going on here? And so Jesus tells this parable to help explain. It's not so simple. You see, there are four different types of hearers. 
four different types of soil, four different types of hearts, and how they respond to the Word of God. And it gives them some categories to kind of hold on to and to understand what's going on as God's Word goes forth. But one thing that should be clear in the way that he tells the story is that you should want to be the good soil. Whether you sit here and try to name names and think, okay, well, so-and-so, he's probably that kind of soil, and so-and-so is probably that. You should step back a minute and say, like, I want to be the good soil. I don't, I don't want to be the path, just reject Jesus. And, and I don't want to be the, the rocky soil. I don't want this just to be the quick thing, and, and then I fall away. And I don't want to be immature. I don't want all the stuff of life to get in the way of following Jesus. I want to be the good soil. That should be our desire. And Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And this is open invitation for all of us to be fruitful. You don't have to be socially or economically or politically or ethnically or nationally such and such to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. Anyone with the ears to hear can be fruitful in the kingdom of God. It's nothing to do with your behavior or your respectability. You can take anyone from any class, any sort of earthly distinction. And that invitation goes forth to hear the word of God. And it's genuine for all of us. And so we are called, if we have ears, to hear. Now, in this parable, there's both a warning and an encouragement. And that's really true with all of the Word of God. See, the Word of God is an instrument that the Holy Spirit uses to bring a person to faith, but it's also an instrument that's used to harden hearts. So there's always a warning tied in as well. And the warning is this. There are obstacles that prevent us from believing or persevering or fruitfulness. There's testing that comes, trials from outside that come to us, difficulties that make you want to give it all up. Whether it's losing a loved one, losing a job, persecution in all of its forms, testing tempts us to say, how can there be a loving God in all of this pain and mess and violence? And there's another obstacle, which is the cares and riches and pleasures of life. These are temptations not from without that come on us, but often temptations from within. They're not difficulties that make you want to give up, they're pleasures that make you want to lose focus and be apathetic. They're not the hard things of life that make you say, how can there be a loving God? They're the pleasurable things of life that make you say, why do I need God? It's money. It's retirement. Focusing your whole life on playing golf in your 60s and 70s on a beach. It's sex, it's alcohol, it's the party lifestyle. It's chasing experiences, being an influencer. It's being preoccupied with leisure and recreation. Caring more about the basketball game last night. And things are going well, things are going great. Everything's roses. We get apathetic. We get lazy and we ask, why do I need God? cares and the pleasures and riches of life choke us out, choke out the word of God and keep us immature. But the encouragement is this, that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you come from, if you have ears to hear the word of God, hear. It's for you. It's for all. Hear the word and hold it fast. 
that once you receive this word of God, you guard it zealously. You hold it fast. You hold tight. You cling to it. Despite whatever else is going on, the Old Testament is full of warnings to guard, to keep watch over the word of God and his instructions for us. Hold it fast in an honest and a good heart. A good heart that's receptive to God's word, the seed. It's not hardened, but it's open. And then it says you bear fruit with patience. Patience. What distinguishes from the rocky soil. Not just the immediate reception of joy, but patience that endures. That takes place over years and years. You go and find a mature Christian. Someone that you know has a deep faith and walks with the Lord. And I'll show you someone that's lived a long life of guarding and clinging to the word of God. Someone that's persevered through the storms, battled their own demons. They're not rattled by the hard, and they're not taken in by the pleasures. And over the years they've grown, we have those people in our church family. And even as we were singing our last song, Cornerstone, I was thinking about those who even in the past year have been hit with storms of life. The difference between the thin soil and the good soil is that when persecution comes, when that sun, the blazing sun hits thin soil, it burns it up, it withers it. But when that blazing sun comes with good soil, the roots grow deep. And I've seen that, and I hope you have seen that. People in this church who have suffered in the past year or two or three or five, they did not wither, they did not fall away. Their roots have gone deep. By God's grace, they have weathered the storms of life. And it shows, and it's beautiful. It's led them to a fruitful Christian life. And you remember the fruit of the Spirit, don't you? From Sunday school class way back when, Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Don't you want those things in your life? Don't you just wish you had more gentleness and joy in your life? Not just because things are going well and it's easy, but because it springs out of you. We usually talk in terms of salvation, like forgiveness, justification, adoption. And that's all good and well, and we should. But part of being saved is the fruit of the Spirit. That I see there's more peaceableness in me, more patience in me, more kindness in me, more self-control in me. That's true spiritual fruit. I think I've said this a few times. I've been reading the Narnia books to my oldest child. Recently we finished the last book, the seventh book. I'm going to read to you from the seventh book, the Chronicles of Narnia, the last battle. And if you remember the story, they're waging a war in Narnia, and there's a stable. And they don't know what's inside the stable, but they're pretty sure it's evil and dark, and they don't want to be in the stable. But the good guys get captured, they're thrown into the stable, only to discover that on the other side of the stable door, they're in Aslan's world. They've been transported into Aslan's world, and it's beautiful beyond description. And they run further up and further in, to soak in the beauty and the majesty of being in Aslan's world. But not everyone sees it that way. Lucy led the way, and soon they could all see the dwarfs. They had a very odd look. They weren't strolling about or enjoying themselves, although the cords with which they had been tied seemed to have vanished. Nor were they lying down and having a rest. They were sitting very close together in a little circle facing one another. They never looked round or took any notice of the humans till Lucy and Tyrion were almost near enough to touch them. Then the dwarfs all cocked their heads 
as if they couldn't see anyone, but were listening hard and trying to guess by the sound what was happening. Look out, said one of them in a surly voice. Mind where you're going. Don't walk into our faces. All right, said Eustace. We're not blind. We've got eyes in our heads. They must be darn good ones if you can see and hear, said the dwarf, whose name was Diggle. And where, asked Edmund. Why, you bonehead, in here, of course, said Diggle, in this pitch-black, pokey, smelly little hole of a stable. Are you blind, said Tyrion? Ain't we all blind in the dark, said Diggle? But it isn't dark, you poor dwarf, said Lucy. Can't you see? Can't you see me in the sky and the trees and the flowers? How in the name of all humbug can I see what ain't there? And how can I see you any more than I can see me in this pitch darkness? Oh, the poor things, this is dreadful, said Lucy. Then she had an idea. She stooped and picked some wild violets. Listen, dwarf, she said. If your eyes are wrong, perhaps your nose is all right. Can you smell that? She leaned across and held the fresh, damp flowers to Diggle's ugly nose. But she had to jump back quickly in order to avoid a blow from his hard little fist. None of that, he shouted. How dare you? What do you mean by shoving a lot of filthy stable litter in my face? There was a thistle in it, too. It's like your sauce. And who are you, anyway? Oh, Aslan, said Lucy through her tears. Could you do something for these poor dwarfs? Dearest, said Aslan, I will show you both what I can and what I cannot do. He came close to the dwarfs and gave a low growl. Low, but it set the air shaking. But the dwarfs said to one another, Hear that? That's the gang at the other end of the stable, trying to frighten us. They do it with a machine of some kind. Don't take any notice. They won't take us in again. And Aslan raised his head and shook his mane. Instantly a glorious feast appeared on the dwarf's knees. Pies and pigeons and trifles and ices, and each dwarf had a goblet of good wine in his right hand. But it wasn't much use. They began eating and drinking greedily enough, but it was clear that they couldn't taste it properly. They thought they were eating and drinking only the sort of things you might find in a stable. One said he was trying to eat hay. And another he had got a bit of an old turnip. And a third said he found a raw cabbage leaf. And they raised golden goblets of rich red wine to their lips and said, Ugh, fancy drinking dirty water out of a trough that a donkey's been at. Never thought we'd come to this. But very soon every dwarf began suspecting that every other dwarf had found something nicer than he had. And they started grabbing and snatching and went on quarreling. Till in a few minutes there was a free fight and all the good food was smeared on their faces and clothes or trodden underfoot. But when at last they sat down to nurse their black eyes and their bleeding noses, they all said, well, at any rate, there's no humbug here. We haven't let anyone take us in. The dwarfs are for the dwarfs. There will be those who try to convince you that the blessings of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit are not blessings at all. In fact, they don't even exist. And that all the pleasures and riches of the world are better anyway. And to them, the feast tastes like turnips. And they refuse to be taken in. But if you've gone through the stable door, then you know how good it is. And you know how real it is. And if you know the great king, you know that you've been giving pleasures in this life that far exceed anything this world has to offer. And this is available to all who call on the name of the great king, the true Aslan, Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Lord, the Lion of Judah, and the friend of sinners. Let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, you offer us so much you offer it to everybody. You offer us riches beyond compare. And the silly things of this world that we are so often lured into are nothing. Oh Lord, forgive us for our foolishness. Help us to not be like the dwarves who mistake your riches and your glory for darkness and rubbish. Oh Lord, give us good hearts that we may receive you, that we may endure and persevere with you. And may we produce fruit for you, fruit that will never spoil, an inheritance beyond all imagination. O 
Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. elders who are helping to serve communion, if you would come forward at this time and, and take a seat in the front row. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll do so just uh, functionally. You would, If you would approach the table by coming down one of these two center rows, there'll be a station, one on either side of the table with elders serving the bread and the cup. Um, if, you, if you need a gluten-free option for the bread, that's available here at the front. You can take from that and then receive the cup from an elder. As you come forward to receive the bread, uh, we ask that you would take your hands and make a little bowl like this. We'll take the tongs and drop them into your hands. Try to grab at it. I've instructed Rusty to smack you in the knuckles with the tongs. Don't, if you don't believe me, just wait. Uh, just so we can kind of observe a, a no-touch policy here. And then once you've done that, if you could go back to your seats by going along the sides, there's little baskets to put the cups into, and you return to your seat that way. We've been reading scripture this morning that talks about Jesus being the great equalizer. That he shows no partiality. He's, he gives no deference to our, our earthly categories that we so often label ourselves with that everyone is equal at the foot of the cross. And everyone is equal as well at the table. Paul had to write to the Corinthians and say, knock it off. Because there was a priority in coming to the table. He says, no, it's not, it's not how it is among you. We're equal. We're one in Christ. All those earthly distinctions fade away. And so as we come to the table, we come as one. We come as his, his family. And we're reminded of the cross as well. We're reminded of the bread and the cup, his body and blood that was broken and shed on our behalf so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be made right with God, so that we, so that we could be unified together, all claiming one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So the invitation is for all who are part of Christ's family, God's family, to come forward, partake, be nourished and be blessed by this meal. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we're so thankful. You sent your son, Jesus, and he died on our behalf. The death that we deserved. So that we are no longer, we are no longer under the wrath of God. We thank you for this marvelous blessing that we have. And we ask now that this meal that we've shared together would indeed bless us and nourish us just as you have promised. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he says, this is my body. It's been broken for you. Eat it and do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me.
Is there anyone that needs to be served right where they are sitting? Let's pray. Oh Lord our God, we're thankful for this meal. We're thankful that you have made us one. We're thankful that there is a Redeemer, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for all the blessings that we have in him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. As we uh, sing our closing hymn, I ask you to remain uh, in your seats, remain seated. And we'll be taking the deacon's offering as we do the first of every month uh, this money. It was strictly for the deacons to distribute to people who are in need. Um, so please remain seated as we, um, as we at least begin the, our closing hymn.
may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Children are dismissed to the music room. We have a few uh, announcements, uh, as well as I'd just like to highlight that um, the April insert is in your bulletin. There are many announcements and more details in, uh, in there than I'm going to mention now, so please take a moment to look at that. Uh, one of the announcements to highlight is Pastor, Tom, Pastor Tom's uh, retirement uh, party and celebration on June 10th. Um, also, Ladies' Night uh, movie night is coming up this week on Friday. Uh, the new spring quarter begins today as well for Sunday school, so uh, please check your insert for those classes and assignments. Um, a special thanks uh, to the snacks. We seem to be a crunchy congregation. Uh, there have been lots of snacks donated uh, for the children's ministry, and I know the kids are thankful for that. Um, Missionary of the Month is Align Life Ministries. And there is, again, more detail in the insert about Align Life and how you can pray for them and uh, an up, brief update um, as, as to how the Lord's working in their ministry. Last, uh, on the back, you'll see a picture of this book. Okay, uh, there are, are books available out in the narthex. They have been donated by Crossway Ministries, and it's a book about Easter. And it's appropriate for the closing of our Lenten season coming up. Um, there are pictures that are interesting to look at, stories. Uh, I uh, encourage families. They will be going home with families, um, but there are also copies available for everyone. So children, uh, Sunday school age, and families will be receiving one of these. But feel free to take one of these as well. As I said, it's a great way to close out the Lenten season and uh, a great way to prepare for celebrating our resurrected Savior on Easter. Uh, that is all the announcements I have. Have a blessed Lord's Day.